everyone. My name is Chris Grosbeck. Um, I'm with VOA Associates, and I wasn't the original speaker slotted here. The uh, speaker from Japan could not make it, and that's unfortunate, but um, uh, thank you for <laughs> staying to the last here. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I think, has a lot to do with Asia. It's not in Asia, it's in the United States. But um, I think you'll see that there's some connections to the idea of vertical cities, of density, of the idea that institutions have a place uh, in the central business districts. Um, and what I would call, uh, and I'll talk about a little more, is that our cities uh, in Asia and around the world are becoming a little homogenous in terms of they're just, you know, either residential or office or retail. And the place of the institution, the culture that actually everybody holds in common is sort of being moved out or diminished. Um, and in this particular project, and which didn't start out as, as an idea of urbanism, but then started to talk about the idea of urbanism, I, I think has an interesting parallel to the future of Asian cities, especially cities like Shanghai or Beijing, which I spend a lot of time in. Uh, but this is about Roosevelt University. Um, uh, VOA Associates, the architect. Uh, we work with Magnuson Clemensic, who was a big sponsor of CTUBH and who did a fabulous job uh, on this particular project. Uh, we worked with a great contractor, uh, but also Jones Lang LaSalle, international sort of real estate company, as well as the John Buck Company, whose, uh, par some of whose projects were presented earlier today in Abu Dhabi. Let me see if I get this. Um, to start out with Roosevelt University, was actually formed in protest. Uh, it was the Central YMCA College in Chicago. Uh, the uh, President Sparling at that time was asked by his board to show the demographics of his students, fearing that they would use this data to limit the number of African Americans, uh, Jewish uh, people, uh, women, and immigrants that he resigned in protest as well as the faculty and they formed their own new college. So this is a sign of protest. Um, they formed Roosevelt University. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it first started out as Thomas Jefferson University in 1945, but within two weeks, President, Federal, um, President Roosevelt died and they asked Eleanor Roosevelt if they could name the college after him. They did. And what they did within a year for a dollar, they bought the auditorium building, the Adler and Sullivan building, the historic landmark, which I'll go on to say was the first vertical mixed use building in the world. Okay, it included office, hotel, a great theater. And they've been stewards to this building. Uh, and this, this project which I'm talking about will connect into this. Um, we were asked to create a distinguished and high quality academic environment. Um, what they needed was, uh, the, the core of the program was long span spaces for lecture halls, for laboratories, for classrooms, which they could not get within their existing auditorium building, their flagship building. Um, but they also wanted to make sure that this building represented their mission, which is based in social justice, which I think when you think of the world and you think of sustainability, that those two concepts are deeply tied together. Uh, and they've and they actually, and they promote this and they want this building to represent this. Um, and of course, as an institution, they're looking to the future. They're looking to the next 50 or 100 years versus a developer who builds a building commercially, turns it around and sells it. Um, now the context, the most incredible context in the world. Now we start out, we were talking about Manila and uh, we're talking about um, Daniel Burnham as providing the plan for Manila. But one of the advantages of being in Chicago is that it's a planned city and was planned with the idea of a heter heterogeneity of use within the core. Not only do you have uh, office and commercial but you have public park, you have public institutions, you have museums, libraries, theaters, all these 
inhabit the core and makes a very vital city, a city that works, you know, in a daytime and a nighttime scenario. And the plan is still being developed, you know, and realized. Just, you know, certain pictures and you can start to see that our, our particular site is in the center of this plan. Uh, and as you can see, conventions, stadiums, art museums, uh, public places all inhabit the centerpiece of this plan, this vision of a society. Um, and as you can tell, uh, you know, as you can see the Sears Tower, you know, the, the tall building and the public place, I think, cohabit very nicely here as, as some more scenes. And I, I'm only showing these because sometimes when we show this, a lot of people haven't been to Chicago and, and don't realize this, but our site is right in the center there with the Auditorium Theater, sorry. If I may, right here. It's actually connected to the auditorium theater as we'll go through this. I'll go now. Uh, one of the things about our site, though, is that um, it's connected to the auditorium theater, but it actually faces um, the first street in from the park. It's called Wabash Avenue, which is a very sort of gritty street, but it sort of expresses a public infrastructure of the L. Uh, so you have this monumental park side where you see the lake, but then you have this very, very urban place with the L. And if you watch movies like Batman or, you know, they always use that as kind of a stage set, you know, but it, but because it does have a romance. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, ignore the L, that we, that we celebrate the fact that we were attached to public transportation. Uh, but Chicago wasn't always like that. It was a trading town. Uh, then there was a great Chicago fire. Um, Daniel Burnham, as, as everyone knows, uh, he's here being in Shanghai, just having the World Exposition, uh, the 1898 uh, Columbian Fair, sort of set the model for a lot of the planning of the cities that we see today, Washington, D.C., uh, Chicago, we talked about Manila. Um, and we had the Burnham Plan. And the Burnham Plan was basically how do we embrace the lakefront with those things that we hold in common. And I think it's, it's very, very interesting that, you know, the auditorium theater was always in the epicenter of this. And I have to sort of say, this is just some ornament from Louis Sullivan, one of the only architects in the modern era whose work looks better the closer you get to it. You know, it's just magnificent work. But how even his ornament starts to reflect the grandiosity of, of this type of planning that, that you saw. But Roosevelt University is in the auditorium building, and as if you know a little about history, inspired by H. H. Richardson's uh, Marshall Fields Warehouse, except the fact that Roosevelt University incorporated a tower, uh, sort of emerging from this block, a very, very romantic notion. But the thing about Roosevelt University has the great theater, the great auditorium theater, which is about 4,000 seats, is known as having near perfect acoustics and is still in use. Um, but it has all these other really great romantic spaces inside. Okay, it's a, one of the most beautiful buildings, I, I think, in Chicago and certainly in, in the world. Uh, and we're hooking into this. This is part of our campus. So we have this great sort of, you know, obligation. A picture of the auditorium theater, as you can see. Um, picture of another, another one of the performing spaces called Gons Hall. Beautiful design. And I'll talk about this later, the idea of diversity. Each one of these column capitals is designed differently. Each one of these windows is designed differently. This, this great richness and detail. But the one thing about Roosevelt University is that it also inhabits in another Louis Sullivan building down the street. So it's one of the only universities that is almost completely housed within landmark buildings. Um, well, so what, what do we do? We have a 32-story vertical campus. It's about 143 meters in height. And it has all the components of the university. It has residential, uh, 620 odd beds of residential, seven floors, the main core of this, academic spaces. You get laboratories, big lecture halls, flexible classrooms. Uh, and then we have a whole student union and student services, student life. It has all the components of the university. Uh, in one building. Um, of course, it's, it's a lead. I uh, believe it will attain gold status. Um, and we're looking for the fact that we know this building has to work 
for the next 50 years. Now, as you can see, we're located right in the epicenter of the Burnham plan. This is the auditorium building, and we're right here, but we're on a very small site. Site is only 17,300 square feet. And we have uh, not only the landmark um, auditorium building, but we have also have historically significant fine arts buildings um, connected to us, and we have to retain a facade of another historical building uh, designed, the Fine Arts Annex by Andrew Bory, who also worked for Sullivan. Um, but the beauty here is that we are in the epicenter of public transportation, both the CTA, subway, bus transportation, lots of public parking, so we don't need to include parking in this. So our challenges are how do we actually, knowing that we're going to have to go high, we're actually inserting a high-rise mid-block surrounded by historical buildings. So we're looking at what we have to do in terms of noise and views. Um, we're actually taking down uh, an existing building, uh, but keeping the pilings. And as you know, Chicago, or some of you may know, it's basically landfill from the fire. So many of the, you're basically building on the lake. So there's, you know, the foundations, you cannot really build basements in Chicago. Um, so we know that we actually have to take a high rise and insert it mid block. So right away, given the fact that we only have about 100 feet of span here and about 170 feet here, that we understand that um, to be able to connect to an existing building, that we have a structural situation of two things that we have to solve technically. This is a very first thought, that we have to shift the core to the north, to mid-block, because we have to be able to get enough space to get the long spans necessary for the classroom, the auditoriums, and the large span spaces. We have to be able to directly connect into the auditorium building in multiple places and multiple levels. But we also have to work around the fact that we have all these existing pilings uh, that we have to work with. We also have a central power plant for the auditorium theater that we have to remove and keep in operation. And knowing that um, the auditorium building has these wedding cake foundations, which we'll show later, we have to set our structure back and cantilever or hang our building so to touch the building, although so we don't disrupt the foundations. So as we looked at this, we realized that we had to come up with a scheme that said, how does a university work within a tall building model? You know, we, we've seen it, um, a lot of mixed use, where we have like retail and office and, and hotel, but, where we're sitting right now, a great example. Um, with the university, though, the difference in a university is that we're within the model of a building like this, where you zone the office and you zone the hotel and you zone the retail and they're all different sort of elevator banks and all separate zones. Here, we're working on a much smaller site, but all these zones have to interconnect for this to work. So it's a much different elevatoring system. It's a much different mechanical system because you're working both with the same mechanical system serving assembly spaces and uh, residential spaces. So in, in looking at a layout uh, and looking at eventually how we have to resolve this elevator core, these just go and start to show the fact that we have multiple levels and multiple connections that we have to make around the existing auditorium theater. Okay, so not only do we have the obligation of sitting back from the movement against the historical buildings, but we also have to connect on multiple levels. Now, you know, typically as we've talked about, universities at least where, where I've gone and our experience with the universities and looking at Oxford, for example, they're basically horizontal organizations. Uh, although Oxford's very interesting because the different colleges included living, teaching, uh, all within the same sort of colleges, the collection of colleges becoming the university. Those models, at least in America, were, were then sort of solidified by Thomas Jefferson and his design for the University of Virginia, which became a model for many of the land-grant universities in America, um, especially where I went, 
the University of Illinois followed that same model. But what made these universities were the connections of their open spaces of the different zones between residential, academic, and, and recreation or student athletics. Okay. Um, so anyways, um, but there are models for vertical universities. Um, University of Pittsburgh during the Great Depression, 1932, built the cathedral um, tower. Uh, this contained classrooms uh, and administrative and libraries. Um, this is really more of a symbol, um, but was built during a time of, um, uh, of economic decline. A couple examples in Tokyo, um, uh, the Modi Gakuen um, University, a combination of three universities. Uh, these were, uh, actually these have been featured uh, as nominees for best buildings for, with the Council of Tall Buildings. These are fabulous buildings. But these are really mostly classroom buildings. And um, uh, there's actually two examples of the same university. This is Nagoshi. Um, same thing, uh, just really classroom buildings. Um, so one of our big problems with the tall building is how do we take this idea of the university environment and translate it to a tall building? And how do we do that? Well, you have to sort of create zones and neighborhoods and make sure that those zones and neighborhoods are connected. And we do that through really looking at the circulation space, how that's connected visually throughout the whole structure um, to make this work vertically. Uh, and we are further complicated by the fact that we're against a historic building with different sort of building levels uh, that then we have to then match our own building levels uh, and our own floor to floor heights, uh, which is, makes it even more complicated. So, so basically, this is how we end up. We end up with student services at, at the bottom with connecting atriums and like zones, student unions with connecting atriums, uh, which have both dining, student clubs, athletic facilities. We then have our academic core, which we then have what I would call pre-function space that connects where you're using our exit stairs with actually fire rated glass so that we can actually connect easily from floor to floor. And then we have a whole residential floor, a uh, series of floors which takes up about a third of the building above. So each one of these zones connects either through stairways, atriums, or very, very sort of broad sort of pre-function space that's connected to actually extra wide exit stairs that have glass that connect from floor to floor. But as you can see, uh, and it's very hard to see, each one of these floors, except for the residential floors, is different in its design. You know, the whole thing is different, and the floor floors are different. So this is why we pick what we call the sort of servant, uh, core, mechanical, and then serve space right here so that we can accommodate very easily all the sort of changing, changing floor condition. Um, with, you know, the other part about this is l creating a structural system that aligns both with the residential and a classroom configuration, a laboratory configuration, and of course with large assembly spaces, in this case the dining uh, on the second floor, which has to connect all the way through. Uh, and the first floor serves with an alley in a very, very tight, as I said, it's about 1,650 meter square, square meter site. Of course, the big thing for us is creating a university environment, knowing that once you come in to a building like this, you have to be able to identify, much like you see the green space within a college, you know, that the, the spaces themselves have to have identity, they have to have connection, um, and they have to have sort of the, the functional requirements of state-of-the-art classrooms, lecture halls, um, laboratories, um, all, all the components of what we call state-of-the-art university. Here are the pre-function areas. And then creating those sort of out-of-class spaces where people can see sort of the views. And this is the advantage. This is one of the, this is a tall building with an actual program, you know, with very, very programmed spaces. And what we found uh, with, the, here's a sample dormitory, what we sort of found was that what we didn't know was how those would really feel once they were built, and we'll go over that fairly soon, 
One of the things that uh, I want to talk about in terms of this building is, of course, the fact that it's an institution and it looks a little different than sort of a normal commercial building. So we took some cues from at least some of my favorite artists, uh, The Endless Column by Ron Cousy, the idea of transformation, which is what this university is about. Um, but also artists like Sola Witt, the idea that you can have diversity, which is what this university is about, within a structure. Um, and interestingly enough, The Endless Column became somewhat of a inspiration for Louis Kahn's city building, uh, part of his Philadelphia plan, which again was an institutional building within the larger city plan. But we also looked at buildings which we thought were really great that had offset cores. Um, one project in particular where I worked uh, was the Inland Steel Building in Chicago where the core is expressed in the clear span space right down the street from us. Also looking at how a modern building fits within a historic complex is the John Hancock building in, in Boston. Uh, I had the privilege of working for Ryan Payne Partners and, and really understood a lot about how they plan this. How do you create density but still retain that historic fabric? So, so basically, as we looked at a tower emerging, we had to use the economics of rectangular structure, but then start to express are out of, out of class spaces as the structures sort of bowed out, sort of creating expression of the different zones within the university. And I'll go through this fairly quickly because I think I've got about 10 more minutes here, probably less. Um, as you can start to see, we start to get then a university which um, connects directly to the auditorium building, which takes the serve spaces creates a glass envelope to take advantage of the great views of Burnham Park. And then the servant spaces are sort of expressed in this sort of precast concrete back, which provides the main structure of the building itself. And you start to see, you know, as we bring this down to the ground level, we're basically squeezed between two historic buildings. So, so the, that the idea of the tall building can sort of work within what we call a mid-block location. And that it actually has visibility from the public transportation and visibility then from the park itself. But in and of itself, it is different. It's not a commercial building. It does say something like the Burnham Plan talks about institution on the park itself. How much more time do I have? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, because I, I don't want to, it's, it's the last. I'll just go through very quickly. You know, I just want to say a couple things. One of the key problems for us was as we skin the building, how do we actually mask the fact that we have different floor to floor heights? Thank you. Um, and how do we pick the glass colors and things like that in such a way as we create a pattern to match the original auditorium sense of gradation of stone from rough to light? In our case, we're going from light to dark. Um, I want to say one thing about the structural system. It's really, I think, a it's like building a Swiss watch in this particular location. It has to be set back from the historic buildings. The core uh, is relatively big, you know, compared to the actual site, yet it has to go up. It's a long, thin building, so the core uh, and outriggers uh, have to sort of stabilize the building. Uh, this is, again, MKA work. Uh, it gives you an idea of how they're handling the structure. Um, each floor is different. So they have, a, I think, a very, very hard job. This shows how the wind loading is taken care of, these super columns. I love this diagram because this shows them having to then thread the new foundations and still use the foundations of the existing dormitory building that was torn down. Um, each floor is different for them and has different vibration and, and movement requirements. Uh, sort of gives you an idea of, of what this mat looks like. Um, connections at multiple levels. Uh, but this is one of my favorite diagrams uh, here showing the fact that the columns are set back and the floors are cantilevered so that the existing building and its foundations are completely uh, avoided. Uh, and then, of course, the problem of restoring and adding 
a historical facade on the facade itself. And then the only other thing I would say is that universities, <laughs> this university was built in the middle of the global financial crisis. And a university is not like a commercial building. Uh, it doesn't sell space. Uh, it has to somehow raise bonds. And uh, it was sort of counterintuitive that a, a college like this would be able to build, be the only crane in Chicago for the last four years. Um, and took a lot of courage for the university uh, to be able to, um, you know, go out and, and believe enough in itself to be able to finance this building. Um, and talk a little about the sustainability, but really, um, and I'll, I'll leave that to the end. Again, here's a finished building, these connecting spaces um, that you start to see, and the idea of pre-function spaces that connect you <coughs> both the lake and the uh, central business district. But the one thing I'd like to say about these spaces is that I've never seen such big spaces within a skyscraper so consistently where you had these great rooms that look at to these great views. It's a different way of looking at a tall building. Um, and I think it, it works. Um, flexible classroom spaces, dormitory spaces with <laughs> great views, as you can see. Um, and these are class spaces which really engage with the city itself. And some final photos here. Um, <coughs> this sort of tells the whole story, sort of the connection to the auditorium, the connection to mass transportation, the connection to the lake, um, the connection. <coughs> they designed the building in such a way as to retain the power of the original expression of the auditorium and sort of be a backdrop showing not only the the patterning here that not only takes care of the different floor floor heights, but also matches the idea of the auditorium in terms of a gradation. And some more pictures to end. S streetscape, um, where the building hits the ground. And, and the idea of, and like you saw in the John Hancock building, Boston, sort of the long thin tower next to the, um, the historical building. What I like about this idea, and I'll sort of end on, on this one, is the fact that the institution can have a place within the city. <coughs> it can have expression, and it can use a tall building model uh, to do this. And I think has, this has a relevance um, to the growing populations in Asia and other cities around the world. Uh, and I think it's very, very important for the life and culture uh, of cities and it's a view from the lake. Thank you very much. <laughs>